everyone. Lead, impact, and transform. That's what we are here today to talk about. And welcome to the first live podcast filming sponsored by Virginia State University's College of Agriculture and the Center for Transformational Leadership. I am Jewel Brunal, your host for today, and we are excited to talk about leadership. Leadership that is so effective that it transforms organizations and it transforms people. How did this vision for this podcast get started? Well, at Virginia State University, we have a transformational leader in President Makola Abdullah. And just through his actions and the way he inspires people, he always reminds us that transformation is incredible. And he challenges us to think about how we help transform communities that are right across the Appomattox River from our university. How do we transform the lives of our students, one student at a time? How do we transform the organization that is Virginia State University? This vision also started with the trust of another transformational leader, Dean Robert Corley, who entrusted me with the vision of having this podcast and our communications director, Erica Shambly, and her team who believed that this podcast could be something that would be very effective in terms of leadership and especially transformational leadership. And when we think about transformational leadership, we think about people who inspire others to make changes, who intellectually stimulate people to generate new ideas, um, who are impactful in the way that they lead. And I am so fortunate to have had the opportunity to work with someone who I feel is an incredible transformational leader. And I want you all to give another warm welcome to our guest today, Mrs. Yang Garrison. Thank you. Welcome. We're so thank happy you. to have you here. Thanks for having me. You know I would do anything for you. Well, so thank you. So I paid her to say that, but thank you for... No, she means that. <laughs> she means that. Um, we we want to have a really relaxed conversation today, and I, I just, I'm so happy that she's here, and I just want to tell you how Yang and I came to form a relationship with each other. Um, in 2021, uh, Yang Garrison and I found ourselves uh, in key leader, leadership positions at USDA. I was confirmed as Deputy Secretary in 2021. Um, she and I became uh, the first African-American women to lead in the number two position at USDA. And uh, of course, we worked under the leadership of Secretary Tom Vilsack. Yang uh, was my chief of staff. We're going to talk a little bit about how tough that job is. But when you're in a position as a first of anything, it's incredibly challenging. And so I knew that I needed an effective chief of staff and someone said, you know, Ian Garrison would be an amazing chief of staff. So I did what, what any thoughtful, smart leader would do. I, I Googled her. <laughs> and when she came up um, online, I, I, it was something about her that made me want to know more. I had the opportunity to interview this woman, and she, she blew me out of the water. Um, Ian Garrison and I have an amazing partnership that we formed uh, in the Deputy Secretary's office at USDA. And you have to understand, USDA uh, has been around for 161 years. We were the first Black woman team in the number two position as Deputy Secretary and Chief of Staff ever in the history of USDA, if you understand how significant that is. And thank you. Um, as you can imagine, USDA is the fourth largest federal agency um, in the federal government, and it, and it has a challenged history of working with people of color. Uh, USDA has come a ways in trying to address those challenges, but you can only imagine um, how we felt the responsibility that we felt as two black women um, at almost the very top of that organization, and we really, really had to form a team this woman is amazing. She's amazingly talented. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about her as we go, but I, I just want you to get to know her. Now, she's, she's kind of chilled when you first start talking to her. But 
you know, before you look, she'll be bossing you around and you don't even know what <laughs> happened to you. And I'm like, that's a real talent that we, uh, we need to talk about. Uh, but she's one of the smartest people that I know. And I'm just, I'm so excited that you're here. Well, that, that was quite the introduction. That's right. Thank you. You, you deserve Thank you. all of it. Thank you. So, I, you know, got a couple of questions because I want folks to get to know you. And, and really the point of today is to talk about leadership and the fact that it looks lots of different ways. There's no one leader or one leadership type that is any better than the other. And I want you to understand that as a message. Um, we are, are all different types of leaders, but we can all be very effective. So we're talking about different types of leadership. So I'm thinking about you and, you know, who you are. Who is Yang Garrison? Tell us about your background, where you're from, a little bit about your education. Just tell us a little bit about who you are. Yeah, sure. Um, you, you, as you guys said earlier, you know, I'm a proud graduate of the University of Oklahoma. Uh, boomer. I have to, I have to say that wherever I go with my parents' background. Um, but you know, I started my roots in Oklahoma. My both my parents are are OU graduates, and um, we moved around a little bit. My dad was a city planner, and so he worked for the city of Houston, worked in the city of Dallas, and we moved to Washington D.C. Um, as I was sort of going into the end of elementary school, going to middle and high school. So grew up a little bit in a lot of different places. Um, but yeah, for me, I think. Um, as, as, as was said in, in, in the introduction, it was really my senior year of high school. We did this sort of model Congress and, um, we had someone who, who was the speaker. We actually had a speaker. We had, we had, um, you know, someone who was the leader. We had members of Congress. And then at the end of this unit, we got to go up to Capitol Hill and walk around and go into hearings and, go into offices. And I just kind of got really excited and got the buzz um, in terms of Congress. So I knew when I went to college, I knew I wanted to major in political science. And so that's what I did. I, I went back to Oklahoma for, for school and, and majored in political science and didn't really, didn't really know anyone that ever worked on the Hill. I didn't, I hadn't, there was no OU pipeline to Capitol Hill, um, hadn't interned on the Hill. Um, and quickly learned that Capitol Hill is a lot about who you know and your relationships, which I didn't have. Um, and so I, I put together a list of members of Congress that I wanted to work for. I started with the Congressional Black Caucus because for me, I really wanted to work for a black lawmaker and sort of went down the list and started making calls to offices and saying, I'm a recent graduate, um, looking for an opportunity, whether it's entry level internship, and I ended up, uh, there was an office, a uh, member of Congress who's since retired from California, um, Diane Watson, who's her intern coordinator said, write me, tell me, tell me why you want to work for her. So I wrote an essay overnight and s submitted it. And the rest is kind of history. They offered me an opportunity and my career sort of was off to the races. But so for me, I'm just, when you, when you ask the question of sort of who, who I am, I'm just one of those people who, you know, I, I, I try not to, I try not to limit myself. I, I try to take risks, um, in my career, which, which I have, which I know we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, um, as we go. But, you know, for me, there's, there's, there's no opportunity that, that isn't within reach. And so that's sort of how I've always kind of viewed, you know, my career and just how I've, how I've navigated my career. That's great. And it's amazing. Um, Yang said she was a political science major. Um, and it's interesting. I'm a, I have an education background. I used to be a high school teacher and we find ourselves in this space in agriculture. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a message there uh, with the fact that uh, you never know uh, where you're going to start and then wh where you may end up. So, you know, for students here who are thinking about what am I going to do when I graduate? Um, your your start may look different from your finish, and there yeah. there's a great message there. But but Yang, I wanna I wanna take you back. Okay. And uh, you see this this darling, cute little girl behind me. This is Yang Garrison. What age were you here? I think I was like third grade ish. We um came to Washington D.C. We had some some friends that lived here. I think we were still living in Dallas, and um. 
we went to we went sightseeing in Washington D.C. and um, here I am pointing at what would be my my future workplace. Um, and uh, I think I was just one of those kids that just. I, I mean, I'm aging myself. I had on a fanny pack, so I don't want to age myself too much. We but fanny pack. Um, you know, she. I think she just was like she thought the world was like was, hey, she could do anything, and so you know, I think the pose and everything speaks for speaks for itself. And, that, and I think it's pretty amazing um, as you look at this picture, and and the message is you, you know you can be looking at your future and not even realize it. I mean, it, she works in Congress. In the third grade, there she is pointing to her future. And I, that's incredibly amazing. Were you a confident kid? Um, were you, you know, gregarious? Were you friendly? How would you describe your personality? I'd say I was a really bubbly kid. I was a little, a little shy. Um, you know, I, I made friends easily, but I was, I was pretty shy. And, um, but, but I was really into school. I was really into, really into math and science and, and, mm -hmm. So I think, you know, I just was like, you know, just just a regular, regular kid. You know, I think I think at this age, I think I thought I was going to be an attorney. I think that was my mm -hmm. an attorney or or a singer. I thought I was Whitney Houston at that attorney time. or singer. So. There you go. <laughs> yeah. that, that's great. Um, I really want everyone to think about uh, the same question. You know, how how would you describe who you may have been in the third grade? It makes us think about where we started. Um, and it also makes me think about my next question. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a question, but here's some words. And I, I have had the privilege of working very closely with the Yang. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say some words that I feel describe you. Okay, so um, problem solver, for sure. Relationship builder, clear communicator. When a Yang tells you something, there's no way you can say you don't understand it. <laughs> Excellent writer. Every email she sends out, not one spelling or comma splice. Charismatic she is. Quick-witted. Does not mince words. Knows more about sports than most guys. A value adder. And she, she calls herself, she's more comfortable, as powerful as she is being behind the scenes. She calls herself the Olivia Pope of agriculture without all the drama. <laughs> that's who she is. That's, that's the goal. One that's day. The goal. One okay. day. Okay. One day. One day. Now, everyone has superpowers. And, and when I talk about superpowers, I'm thinking about those things that you're just naturally good at. Things that you know that people kind of recognize that you may have a special gift for. Um, you notice that it's pretty easy for you. It's that thing that I say is what people eventually will pay you to do. We all have them. Yang, what, what are your superpowers? What do, you, what do you feel are those gifts that you have that really add value to where you work or where you lead? Yeah, no, and, and I, the, the list of things, it's just, it's great for you to, it's making me think about how I view myself, like the fact that you, you see me in, in, that, in that way. I think for, for me, Building relationships, I think the ability to meet people where they are is something that has always served me really well. Um, I'm, I'm the kind of person who I sort of tailor how I do my work uh, with, depending on who I'm working with. And I think sometimes you try to sort of fit people into sort of your style of doing things. And I think a lot of times people really respond when they see you sort of meeting them where they are. And I think you know, I've built a lot of relationships in my line of work. I have to have relationships with people that I don't always agree with um, from, a, from a policy standpoint. So I think it's always important to sort of figure out where can I find common ground? Where can I inject some humor? Um, I think, you know, I have a little bit of a sarcastic personality, and I think that has also served me well. I think you can kind of mix it in. Um, at the same time, you know, setting boundaries and letting folks know that you're not someone, you're not a pushover. Um, I think is important too, but I think there's, there's, there's a balance there. And I, 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 not that I've figured it out, but I think it's one of those things that, um, has served me well. I think from a, uh, another, you, you're saying superpower, I think just I, being someone that people enjoy working with, I think you can be, you can, you can challenge people, 
but still do it in a way where people enjoy working with you. And I think that that is something that has, um, that for whatever reason, people have responded well to it over the course of my, of my career. Um, and so, and I think the writing you, you said, you mentioned writing. I, I used early in my early on, I used to write emails and write them really fast and hit send. And then later I would read it and I'm like, Oh gosh, there's like all these typos that I didn't catch. So I sort of trained myself to always proofread everything, whether it's an email, whether it's, you know, a quick note to someone. Um, obviously if it's an official document I review, but even in your emails, because I think your emails are, are your calling card. Like, you know, a lot of times we communicate over just email. And I think it shows that you, that you care and that you respect the person that's receiving that email. And so I proofread everything. Um, cause I, I think for me, I, attention to detail is another, is another thing for me because it's just so important that I get the little things right, but even the big things and the little things, right. Um, so, um, pay a lot of attention to detail. Uh, it was really, really important for me. So. And you hit on some some things that I, I want to think about. And and Yang is mentioning um, things, and I, especially for the students, I want you to understand the importance of effective communication and good writing, good technical writing skills. Those are two skills that, in almost any leadership role, you are you're going to need to succeed and to be yeah. able to convey information. Um, relationship building that's also key. Um, so you mentioned those. I, I want to pivot to um, there's one, one more thing. One more okay. thing I want to add, and there's something that you've always said, and I think this is also something that I've always done, but I haven't. It wasn't phrased in the way that you say it. You always say, you know, bloom where bloom where you're planted, and I think for me in Washington D.C., it's so easy to sort of get caught up in the okay, I'm going to do this job, and then I'm going to do the next job, and that job is going to help me get this job. And I've never really navigated my career that way. And I think there are, there are definitely people who are very successful who have done that and it has served them well. So, but for me, it's so important for me to be present in the job that I'm in. And so whether it's working for, you know, then Congresswoman Marsha Fudge or working for uh, Dr. Bernal or in the job that I'm in working for Chairwoman Stabenow, I just focus on what I'm doing and really build new skills, learn new things and take those things to the next, to the next job. And I think like the next opportunity will come the last few jobs that I've had, I haven't really had to apply for. It's been, Oh, so I heard about you from so-and-so. Would you be interested in coming to work here? Same thing happened mm -hmm. with Dr. Bernat, USDA. Same thing happened with the job before that. Same thing happened with me coming here, coming into the job that I'm in now working in the Senate agriculture committee. It was, we, we've heard about you. We want you to come and work here. And I think that that is a credit to really being focused on the work that I'm doing and the job that I'm in. So just thinking about uh, us forming a team. Now, let me tell you about effectiveness and where you want to be in, in life and in your career. I, I interviewed Yang when um, I was uh, under nomination for deputy secretary. And I was like, oh, this is such a good interview. And I called her and I said, you know, I want to hire you. I want you to come and be my chief of staff. And, and guess what she said? Oh, I've got three other job offers, so I'm going to get back with you next week. And I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> she put me on ice. And you know what? That's when you're really good, you can make those careful decisions and, and really think about, oh, I've got opportunities because I've worked really hard and then people have noticed. And well, you can I make have the choice. Well, I have to say that we're making the decision to be your chief of staff was one of the best decisions that I ever made. It oh, really was you. the the honor of of my career to to work for you, particularly at at a time in USDA's history where there was so much attention on people that look like us. And so, you know, I thank you for that opportunity. I put you on ice, but ultimately but you I took me off. I ice. knew I knew I was I knew I wasn't gonna say no. And so, um, but I thank you for offering me that opportunity. It was it was an amazing ride. And I just I wouldn't be in the job that I'm in now if it wasn't for that job. So thank you. Yeah, and 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 I appreciate that. And I want to talk about chief of uh, chief of staff. People don't understand. Um, as deputy secretary, I was I was the front face. But the chief of staff is the one who runs everything in the background. So the chief of staff ensures that 
the COO, the president, the deputy secretary in my case, we do our jobs. They keep the trains running in the background. They're making all the decisions behind me. Uh, and they're also looking for pitfalls. So before I stepped somewhere that I didn't have any business stepping, Yang had to see out ahead of me and she had to solve problems before they even started. A chief of staff has to be very detailed. They have to be able to manage up as well as manage down. And it's a really difficult job, but a chief of staff in many times has more power than the person who's out front. And so I want to just talk a little bit about like, what is it, what is a chief of staff to you? And what, what does it take if someone in the audience or who's viewing wanted to, to know how to become one? What do you think it, it takes to be a chief, a good chief of staff? I think it takes a certain level of organization um, because it's, it's sort of your job to make sure that your principal is successful, right? And so it's, it's, my, it's my job to make sure that, you know, as serving as your chief of staff, it was always my job to make sure that you looked good and that we were meeting all the goals that you wanted to meet and that, you know, playing a little bit of traffic cop because everybody wants to get to your principal. And so figuring out how to be respectful of her time, but also how to maximize her time too. And so you're always sort of thinking about not only which stakeholders you need to meet with internally and externally, but also which ones maybe it makes more sense to meet with me or meet with someone else. Uh, and so you're always just sort of thinking about, you know, sort of the organization of the office in relation to making sure that we're meeting all of your priority goals um, and that we're hitting deadlines and we're communicating up, we're communicating to the secretary, we're communicating down uh, to staff. Um, we're, we're making sure folks feel seen. I'm thinking creatively about policy, but also about, you know, how do we, you know, um, you know, we, we did a walk with, with, we did a walk with you. We mm -hmm. did, you know, where, where we had uh, staff could, could walk around the mall with Dr. Bernal, thinking about the mental health of our staff, but also thinking about, okay, we've got this really tough policy we need to figure out too. And so I think you're just always sort of thinking about ways in which to make sure your principal is meeting their goals and, but also being a little bit of a, of the bad guy. Um, so but you're smooth at, you're yeah. very smooth at yeah. that. Like people don't even know that you're being the bad guy because you're so, so smooth at it. And, and Yang helped me coming from outside of Washington, build relationships with members of Congress that she'd worked with. So she directed me from behind the scenes. Um, and that's an incredibly difficult job. But you have moved on to another amazing job. Yang is the staff director for Senator Debbie Stabenow. Uh, Senator Stabenow is uh, the co-chair or chairwoman of the Senate Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry Committee, responsible for getting a farm bill done. Um, let me tell you how incredible this woman is. She started as the deputy staff director in March. So that means in six short months, she got promoted to the staff director. That's, that's evidence of effectiveness. So congratulations, you're a bad girl. <laughs> um, tell us about your job now and, and you know a little bit about what you do that may be a little different from your chief of staff job. Yeah, I mean, staff director is, is, is you're, I'm essentially the chief of staff for the committee. Uh, but it, we we have a, a large team. It's about twenty five staff that that cover various parts of the farm bill farm bill policy, uh, and I'm I, I I manage the the team. I manage you know we managing the farm bill sort of process and that coming together, and then also kind of you know being um, a, a sounding board for the chairwoman in terms of strategy and just sort of talking through. Um, our plans moving forward on farm bill and other committee business. Uh, so I think for the, for the most part, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, the working on the Hill and a staff director position versus a chief of staff. So for folks that, that haven't ever worked on the Hill or interned on the Hill, you have chiefs of staff that are in a personal office. So, so Senator Stabenow has a chief of staff in her personal office while I'm sort of the chief of staff in, in the committee. And so I think there are 37 committees in the Senate. Um, I am the only black staff director um, in, in the Senate, um, which hopefully that changes. Um, 
but um, not the first, but um, but the only uh, at this time. Um, but yeah, ultimately, it's just my job to to be a leader of the committee. I work really closely with our ranking member uh, on the Republican side, ranking member staff, uh, so that we can deliver deliver a farm bill. It's amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. That's awesome. You you talk about a farm bill. And, uh, you know, we're, we're a college of agriculture here. So farm bill, that should resonate with us. But, you know, a lot of times that's a that's a big bill. Um, what What is the farm bill and why should just an average person even care about the farm bill? Yeah. So the farm bill is the most comprehensive piece of legislation for agriculture, nutrition, forestry, research rural development uh, policy that we have. It's a multi-year piece of legislation, typically five-year five year bill uh, that really runs the gamut from everything from commodity policy to the broader farm safety net to conservation, trade promotion programs, uh, food aid programs, nutrition programs, so the family, the family safety net, so like SNAP and funding for food banks. We also fund land-grant universities in 1890s. Mm including scholarships and uh, capacity and infrastructure grants uh, for, for land grants, just like Virginia State University, uh, also centers of excellence um, at, our, at our 1890s and broader um, minority-serving uh, institutions, um, which is really important, obviously, for, for you all. But we also fund research. I'm sure there's researchers here uh, at this university focused in the agriculture space, um, livestock policy, dairy policy, it really just runs the gamut. And also supporting our small, our small towns uh, through rural development programs. So everything from broadband to child care programs to uh, rural hospitals and telemedicine. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty big deal. It's a, it's a bill that really touches really everyone. Um, so it's it's a big deal. Very significant. We're, and we're hopeful. We're, we'll get a farm bill soon. It's, it's coming. It's we're, working, coming. We're, working we're, it. we're working. We're working on it. We're working on it. Thank you. We, we, and we appreciate you being a, as part, a part of that process yeah. uh, because we have a trusted person that we yeah. know. Who's, so we know this is going to get done well. Um, something that you do very well, um, and I always say this, uh, Yang Garrison knows, knows how to add value. And again, I want everyone who's watching to think about how you can add value wherever you are. And, and that means in your family, um, in an organization you work for, or in a leadership position. So I want to ask you, um, what does it mean to you to add value? And, and what kinds of things do you look for when you are going to hire someone? Yeah, I think, I think it's important to, to even think about what value do you add? I think taking the time to really think about what are some unique skill sets that I bring to the table. We talked about writing ability. We talked about just the ability to meet people where they are and, and uh, you know, be able to talk to people and someone who's easy to work with. I think that those are valuable. Those are valuable skill sets that I will always bring to any job that I ever go to. But I also think it's important to really understand where, where you're working and what value is needed for that job if that makes sense. I think there are times where I'm not using all of the skills that I have because the value that's, that I need to add to this specific job is very specific. Um, I will, I use the example of when you asked me to serve as, as your chief of staff. And I really thought about, for me, I think there are a lot of folks that have probably thought I was crazy to even say, let me, you know, let me think about it. I'm back to I'll you. call you back next week. I'll call you back. I'll call you back next week. I think for me, it was really important. This is, this is a, a big deal. You know, you're the first black woman to ever serve as deputy secretary. And I really had to sit back and think about what you need to be successful. And is it me? Is it me? Is it someone else? And we talked a little bit about mm -hmm. this. I think our interview was a little bit unorthodox. I think I stopped you with your interview questions. And I was like, you see what I'm and saying? I said, there you go right and, I said, there. and I said, let's just talk. Let's just talk about what, what you need and achieve. And, you know, you talked about, you know, not, you know, you're, you know, obviously the ag policy side of it, you've got down, down packed and you've already served in the, in the, in the Obama years, but really understanding Washington and the Hill and those relationships, uh, you know, and sort of were a little bit foreign, foreign to you and sort of needing someone who could fill that gap. And so we talked a little bit about 
what sort of value I would add. And so I think for me, for me, it was a great fit because I felt like the places where you were strong, you know, were places where I didn't need to be strong and the places where, you know, I brought value uh, were really valuable for you. So I think it's important when, when I'm hiring someone that they have all, they have all the skill, like the basic skill sets that I need for them to be successful in the job. But also what, what gaps do we have in our organization that this person can fill? And that's, it's something, it takes a little bit of like, you know, maturity in your career to really sit down and reflect and figure out, is this the job for me? Or is this just sort of, uh, it, like, it sounds good. I think, I, I think there are so many people that would have wanted to work for you just because it's a big deal. It's a big deal job. But for me, it's more important that I'm the right fit I'm the right fit for the job and you're the right fit for me. So that's a, that's a great message because it's, it's about building a team. Um, and I realized there were some skill sets that I lacked. One thing I'd looked for, and we had this conversation when, when, well, I actually I said I interviewed her, she interviewed me actually. But part of our conversation was I knew for me as a black woman going into that position, going into a foreign land, which is Washington, D.C., I'm a Virginia girl, that I needed someone I could trust and someone who was going to be loyal. And in Washington, D.C., sometimes information is, is, is money to folks in D.C. So everyone wants to be connected, as you mentioned earlier. And when I asked uh, Yang about loyalty, the, the way she answered that question made me, knew, made, made me know that she was a person who I needed to have by my side. So it's interesting that, that we talk about that. But but I also want to want to pivot a little bit to you mentioned um, us being you know we're African American women in this first time kind of in this type of position, and um, as women leaders, um, as people of color in leadership, as women leaders of color, um, it sometimes is a challenge um, that we go through, and, and you know we understand. Uh, really who we are when we come into these positions and, and kind of the weight on our backs of, of who we are in these positions. As a, a woman leader, leader of color, do you feel comfortable being your authentic self? And, and if yes. you don't, you know, why not? Yeah, I, I think I've always had a healthy level of imposter syndrome throughout <laughs> my career. Um, I also deal with a lot of anxiety. So I think the fear of failure is always sort of in the back of my mind, which I think helps me just continuously, again, attention to detail, continue to work hard because I think there's always this anxiety of like, you know, do I, do I actually belong? Like there's sometimes where, you know, when spaces with you or with Secretary Vilsack or with the chairwoman uh, now that I work for where I'll say something and you're like, oh, that's such a, such a, so great such a great idea. Uh, and I'm sort of like, I just, I literally just made that up. I don't really know. Like sometimes I'm like, I don't really know what I'm doing, but I'm just figuring this out. Um, but the truth of the matter is that I do. And I think when you get to a certain level in your career, you realize that I think we're all sort of figuring this out. No one really knows exactly what they're doing. We're all sort of, you know, throwing out ideas and, and sort of seeing what sticks. And, uh, I think, um, I try to lead with, with confidence. Uh, I try to, uh, I, I know that there are other people that look like me that are looking at me and, and are proud and excited. And so for me, I, I, I take every day. I'm so grateful for every day. I tell our staff all the time that, you know, I, I'm just, I'm so grateful to be here. You know, I took, I took the local route, not the express to, to get here. I had a lot of different jobs, a lot of, you know, I, I, I wasn't someone who sort of like came up in the Senate and, you know, here I am after years in the Senate. And so for me, it's just every day is an honor. And every day I try to learn something new. Uh, it's just, again, it's important for me that I know that there are other women or women of color that are looking at me. And so I just, I don't take that responsibility lightly. You know, it's, it's, it, it can be a heavy responsibility because I think a lot of, especially when I first got named in this job, and I think you can probably relate to this, right? When you were named as deputy, like everywhere you go, everyone's like, oh, this is so huge. 
this is so exciting and we're so proud of you. And it's just like, you know, you feel sort of this immense responsibility to, 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 to do a good job and, and create a path for others so that, so that it's normalized, so that it's, so that it becomes normalized. And it's not sort of something where people are like, this is so cool. You know, I had a senator, I had a senator tell me, this is so cool. This is so cool. And I was like, it should be. It is cool. It should be normal, right? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I I appreciate one thing that you said. You you mentioned feeling uncomfortable and anxious, and I think sometimes people don't understand. You find yourself in these places, and you know you try to appear cool, calm, and collected. But a lot of times, you know, there's a learning curve. You don't yet know what you're doing, and you're just a little bit anxious. Yeah, And, and that's the reality of it. That's the human side that people need to understand when you're in leadership roles, you have to grow into them a little bit. And and it's so important to have good mentors and it's good. And it's, I've had really good mentors uh, throughout my career that have stayed, stayed with me. And, you know, even yesterday I was anxious about something and there were, there were, I made a couple calls to folks and just to, just to talk through what I was thinking. And I think it's just important that you have good people to go back to, whether they are people that came up with you in your career, people that are that are older or retired, just having those those folks to go back to just to say, like, here's what I'm thinking. Does it does it make sense to you? And, and it's, it's OK to do that. And I think sometimes people are sort of prideful. You don't want to you don't want to seem like you don't know what you're doing. I have no problem going to folks saying, I'm not sure I'm not sure if this is the right way to do this. What do you think? Because I, I think it's just important to. Uh, to lean on, on, on people that you trust and, and Absolutely. have invested in you. So. Well said. Uh, and funny story. Um, yeah, I talked about us being black women in this role. One of our sidebar conversations was I, I went to Yang's office and I was like, Yang, I want to, I want to wear some braids. <laughs> and Yang was wearing braids and she was like, you know, I thought about my braids too. And so she's, you know, she kind of set the trend of wearing braids in our office and I was like, I'm gonna get some braids. So uh, on a, right before a trip that we had, um, I can't remember if went it was, to Bali. To it was Bali, a Bali trip. Yeah. I got braids, and there we were. And we had our comms director, and they Ma- looked amazing, Michaela Carter. Yep, <laughs> and we were three, three black women at at the top of USDA under the secretary, and we were rocking our braids. And we just, it just, I felt good. I felt good about that. And I, I tell the students. You know, interesting, you all may not think about a conversation about braids being that significant, but, but you know, in this society, you even as a woman of color, you have to think about how we wear our hair and yeah. if we're, we're comfortable and we'll, we'll be accepted with those hairstyles. But we broke a, a little bit of a mold. And the, and the response to that when you wore braids, I don't think anybody really cared that I wore braids, you know, but... Yes, they did. But the response when you did... Uh, from the staff at USDA, from from the the Black career staff at USDA, was tremendous. I mean, the amount of staff that came up to me that said, like, I just, I feel, I feel so seen. Like, she's, she's just, you know, they just, I think it, it, just something that small. Um, and I know we talked about to get braids or not to get braids. I know you time. were like, should I get them? Should I not? And, uh, and it was just like the response was just in- incredible. And I think sometimes you don't realize how important you are to other people that are looking up to you. And I think that was one of those moments where I realized that, wow, like something like that had such a profound yeah. impact on the people that we we serve internally at, at USDA. So I thought that was that was amazing. And we were meeting with the president of Kenya. You got your braids. We're meeting with, yep, we you know, dignitaries the at the do. G20, you know, and you're coming in with your braids. And I just, I loved every minute of it. Yep. So that's our, that was our unspoken power. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, I know we don't have a, a lot of time left, but I, I want to put up uh, an, one more slide. And um, I'll ask you another question when um, that slide comes up. She looks fabulous with her braids, doesn't she? <laughs> So we, we position the, the now uh, incredible Ian Garrison beside the third grade incredible Ian Garrison. And how, how do you describe this woman compared to the third grade kid or have they changed at all in your opinion? 
You know, I think just, I think I've always, like again, I think I've always just been open to trying new things and, you know, been a little somewhat uninhibited in terms of, you know, the, the opportunities that I go after. And so I, I think that the, 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 the young girl in the picture to the right would be really proud of the woman in, on, on, on the left here. So. Um, the one thing I didn't say towards the beginning of, of this conversation was in terms of getting into agriculture, you know, I didn't, I didn't go to a land grant university, the university of Oklahoma is not the land grant. It's actually Oklahoma State University uh, in the state of Oklahoma. So when I came to the Hill and I was sort of matriculating up and, and working in a congressional office, agriculture was an issue that no one was handling. And I was asked to handle the issue. And I was like, I don't really know a lot about agriculture, but okay. And then I just fell in love with the issues. I fell in love with the stakeholders. I fell in love with the farmers that would come in to talk to me about, you know, their dairy farms. I fell in love with the farm tours and visiting the WIC clinics. And, and I just really fell into, really fell into it. And I, and I say that to say that again, with the sort of taking, like taking risks and being open to trying new things, because I came to the Hill, had, was not trying to have a career in agriculture I think a lot of, I, sometimes I, I'll meet with young people and they're like, well, I want to come in and I want to work for this member and I want to work on education or I want to work in this space. And I always tell them, be open because an office that you go to, there's probably someone already handling those issues. And so I, I got agriculture as an issue and was willing to take it on and I made an entire career out of it. And now here I am in a, in a top position in, in the U.S. Senate and and so just a credit to sort of who I, who I was, who, who I am. And, and uh, it's, just, it's just important that, you know, you can, you can do anything. And I think that's the other message in the agriculture space. Agriculture is not monolithic, as you guys know. It's, it's a lot of different things. Uh, and you can be a policymaker, uh, like, like myself, or work for a policymaker. And so, um, and so I'm, really, I'm really proud of that. I'm really, really proud of that. So I just wanted to, wanted to share that. that that's amazing. Um, you, you have really left some tidbits of information, some nuggets with us today. And, and just talking about skill sets, your experience, who you are, how you came to be. One of the things that uh, Yang and I would talk about all the time and I would tell her, I would say, Yang, I, I'm... You know, I'm nearing the kind of the latter part of my career. She she's a, a shooting star, and I just want to step back and watch you go as high as you can because there's no place that you can't be. I would never have been um, able to be a deputy secretary without you. I'm so grateful for you. Um, I'm inspired by you. You are amazing, and um, keep an eye out for this incredible woman who is Yang Garrison. So thank you, thank you so much. And let's give her a big round of applause because she's awesome. Thank you, Yang. Thank you so much for having me. Thank absolutely, you. Thank absolutely. you. And and the same goes, the same goes for you. Like I said, you know, that working for you was was one of the the not only one of the best decisions that I ever made, it was a highlight in my in my career and and you know, I know we will we will be close and and friends forever. But I just I just wanted to tell you thank you so much for that for that opportunity. Absolutely. It continues to pay dividends. I always talk about you uh, and talk about the things that that we learned and did while we were at the department. So thank you so much. Amazing. And Yang Garrison is the first of our podcast series, and this is pretty exciting. We hope to continue this, and I'm just glad that that you were able to start us off today. So that that is amazing. So um, thank you, everyone, for, for joining us today. Um, I just want to thank you for this journey that we're going on. We hope to really showcase uh, leaders who are able to transform people, places, and organizations. Um, I, I want to thank a couple of people. Dean Robert Corley, uh, I thank you for being an amazing transformational leader and supporting this. And Dr. Janine Woods, our extension administrator, who's here today. Um, I want to recognize and thank the team who assembled this amazing podcast and another amazing leader, the communications director, 
Erica Shambly and the entire team who has worked to develop this podcast. This is this is something new. And when I went with uh, Dr. Latia Scott to sit down with Erica Shambly to say, hey, can we try something new? They literally took this ball and ran with this and created what you see today. So it's all about something new and something something that's very exciting. Um, our students, our, our moderator, um, Desmond Owens, thank you for moderating today. Let's give her a round of applause. I want to thank, and all of the team who um, was responsible for pulling the kind of the, the whole podcast together, would you either stand or wave to be recognized because, stand up, Erica, stand up. Don't be shy, Herman, everybody stand up. I, I, some of them are all right here in front, but I wanna thank all of you all. And um, there are always folks that are um, kind of behind the scenes. We have an incredible administrative team who helped, um, Ms. Molly Klein, Ms. Deborah Jones, um, and Ms. Dory Banks and all the other folks who helped pull this together. It's amazing. Um, and so I appreciate it. It takes a team to get anything done. So we're just starting. We're just starting. There's no place that we cannot go. So uh, we look forward to the next time we invite you to our, our next podcast. And we're going to see how this goes. But don't leave just yet because uh, we will have a small reception upstairs. And if, you know, you feel so inclined, I'll get to be your blocker this time. I'm like, wait in line. <laughs> and you want to talk with the Yang Garrison. She's been gracious enough to just spend a little bit of time with us. And we have lunch upstairs as well. So we just invite you to come upstairs and join us in room 300 A and B, I think it is. Yes. Thank you so much.